Hi there, my name's Vince from MyMateVince.com and in this video today, I am looking forward to this. This is Elliot's £24 Nintendo Switch. So Elliot from the Retro Future managed to get a Switch from eBay for £24. And of course it was the normal eBay buy where you buy it and the seller says they don't know what's wrong with it and it turns out that it's water damaged. So as soon as I seen that I thought, ooh, because they're water damaged. Normally you can spend all day on it and the outcome's still not normally good. Well, with me anyway. If you haven't watched me before, I'm not a professional at any of this. But I have taken apart quite a few switches now. So I do actually feel quite confident with them. And I've had two water damaged Nintendo switches and I managed to get one working. Now that one only had a little bit of water damage and the other one I tried to do everything and I couldn't get it working and that was really bad. Elliot's one seems to be a cross between the two, so I really don't know if there's hope for this. So when I spoke to him and he suggested sending it to me, I thought, fantastic, I really would like to have a look at it. So, let's uh, see what we've got here. Oh nice, I've got a few little stickers. Cheers Elliot. Retro Future. Vince, best of luck fixing the switch. Best wishes, Elliot. What's that say? Holly the Illustrator. Right, okay, obviously I'll leave links to the original video down in the description and also a link to Elliot's channel as well. I know a lot of my subscribers are already subscribed to him, but if you're not, check him out. I think you will like his videos. They're really, really nicely edited as well. Puts mine to shame. Right, let's uh, rip this open and let's see what's going to happen with it. So basically, a little bit of background. He did try the uh, his own motherboard from his Nintendo Switch in this one here, and basically it still, I, I, it still didn't work. And then he tried the motherboard from here, so the 14 motherboard in his Nintendo Switch, and it didn't work, but the backlight did light up. So there's obviously a little bit of power there, but nothing was being displayed. So now what I'm gonna to do to begin with is, I'm gonna see if this thing is actually drawing any power or not, and that will give us a little bit of a better idea of what's happening. So plug that into there. I've got my Nintendo Switch Pro Controller cable here, the charging cable. Let's plug that into there and let's see what this is reading. Okay, that's not good. So it should be at around 0.4 and then what normally happens is it goes back to zero and then turns a switch on and it comes to normally around 1.4 amps. So yeah, that's not, uh, that's not good. Let's just try it, turn it on and see what happens. Okay, well I went to turn it on there and it did jump up to 0.38 which is the kind of trickle charge amount as far as I know. Let's take this apart and let's see if we can see anything because then we'll see if the backlight's coming on or not it's a lot easier to see then he's done a very good job of cleaning it up what i'm going to do is i'm going to take it all apart in case you haven't seen his video basically there was corrosion everywhere he's cleaned it with ipa and i believe he's let it sit in ipa as well for a while first things first let's just pop the battery out Let's just see if we've got anything in the battery. Right, just on DC. Volts. Right, 2.6. Ah, okay, that's pretty low. Should be 3.7. 2.6, right, okay. Uh, do you know what, I'm gonna see, I'm not even sure if I've got any spare batteries now. Let me check it out, because that's very low. That's very low, just in case that's the reason why it's not uh, why it's not booting up. 2.6. Right, I have found this battery here, which is showing 3.7 volts. It's in a bit of a sorry state, but it will be okay for testing. So if you have a look here. There 
There you go, 3.7 volts. So let's try that one. See what it does. Right, so that's in there now. Now let's plug this in and see what happens. There we go, look, that's the trickle charge. So I think that that battery is faulty. So it's either completely discharged itself, but maybe if it was left charged up for ages, it might come back to life. Right, so that's that. Now, it hasn't turned itself on, so we've still got a problem, but let's see what happens when we do turn it on. Right, so it went to zero, and now it hasn't come back on. And I can't see... I don't think that backlight's come on. Well, that's interesting. So there's nothing there, but now it won't charge at all. Let's take the battery out. Now let's put it back in. Isn't that weird? So when we turn it on, it uh, it kills. It seems to kill the power completely. Down the power button. It didn't kill it that time. Well, right, okay. Well, not really getting anywhere at the moment, but it definitely looks like this battery is a bit iffy. So I think we'll do our testing with this. I think what we should do before we go any further is take the board out and then use our multimeter and see if we can see any shorts across the capacitors. So that's what I'm going to do now. So we have the board out now. Now just because it looks good, it doesn't mean it is good. So there was a lot of corrosion on this beforehand, so it's done a good job of cleaning it up. But you see there's still going to be corrosion underneath the chips and stuff like that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to use my multimeter and I'm just going to be going across the different capacitors. So I'm going to be using, for example, the ground from here or here. And then I'm just going to be tapping each side of the capacitors and I'm hoping to find that maybe some of them are shorted and that might give me an indication as to what chip is faulty. Just to give you an example, I'm just putting my meter to uh, continuity. So when I touch the leads, they, uh, they short and then I can put one probe on here and then I can just go across the capacitors. So you get the idea, so this is going to take me quite some time, and when I find out what's, if there's anything that doesn't look normal, of course, I'll start filming. Right, OK, I've been going across it, and unfortunately, I think it's uh, bad news. Now, I was suspecting it might be something to do with this chip here, the very fact that it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't basically turning itself on fully. I was hoping to find shorted capacitors around here, but I've gone across all of them here, and they're all testing absolutely fine yeah so then I went down and tested this chip and although some of the capacitors are very corroded again they are they're not shorting but annoyingly I've gone across the capacitors down here and this line here is shorting so I think it's going to be to do with the main chips under here you know like the main engine so look if I go across here let me zoom right in so you can see Right, so I've zoomed in right now just to show you where we are. This is the USB-C down here. Okay, so we're looking at these capacitors down here. And look, if I put one lead to a ground, and then if I go across here, you can see that these are shorting on both sides. So I believe that because all of these capacitors are underneath the main chip on the other side, I think that is to do with the main chip. I mean, I don't know but that shouldn't be there. So if I have a look at my two other junk boards, these are other boards that are unrepairable, I've just been using for spares and stuff. So if you look at this one here, again, you can see the same row down here and listen. 
see? Can you see they're only shortened on one side? So I think that's our problem. I mean, there might be numerous other problems as well. It's really unfortunate, but what I'm going to do is, I can see that Elliot's already been in here, so I'm going to prise this off again, and I'm going to have a look around on the inside here, just in case just in case there's something obvious there that maybe Elliot didn't see and maybe I'll be able to see. Maybe there's still some corrosion in here. So that's what I'm going to look at now. You can see that there's rust around here. Quite a bit of rust. Right, there's nothing jumping out at me. I mean, there's corrosion still in loads of places when you look closely. So, for example, when you look around the chips all very closely, when I look underneath this here with the eye loop, I can see that there's, uh, it's still kind of like, when you look around the edges, you can see it everywhere. As well as that, you can see around the capacitors that a lot of them are dull on one side. So, annoyingly, I don't think this is going to be repairable, but I'm not going to give up that easy. What I'm going to do is, I'm going to give it another scrub with basically a brush and IPA just do it everywhere and then I'm just going to test it again to see if I can find anything and then I think I'm going to put it in the ultrasonic cleaner because I haven't really got anything to lose because Elliot knows that the, the chances are that this board is going to come back junk but if I can send the rest back to him for example you know the screen might still work the touch screen might still work so hopefully there still will be other parts on this switch so it will probably still be worth the £24 but I don't want to give up on it that easy. It's just that I haven't come across it before where they're shorting down here. And I'm almost certain that because these are right the other side of this main NVIDIA chip here, I think it's going to be a problem with corrosion underneath this chip. Or maybe the corrosion caused this a part of this to short out. So it's just a bit unfortunate, but basically this is the this is the whole line of them. If you have a look closely here, you can see that if you look at the pad, there's a whole line here that's gone. So from here all the way up around to here. So that whole section there is basically shortened. The thing that's slightly confusing me is I can't see any wires or anything that go through to the other side so I don't really know where these are connecting to it just seems to be a whole bank that's connecting and this side here is not the ground it's this side here which is the ground this is the side that's shortened where it shouldn't be I, but I can't see anything that then goes through to the board but then again maybe would it be just that whole piece of copper that goes through directly to the other side? Would that be possible to go through all the layers? I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to give it a clean and then we'll pop it in the ultrasonic cleaner and we'll see if it's testing exactly the same afterwards or not. Okay, so I've given this a real good scrub. I've probably been cleaning it for around 15 or 20 minutes, but Elliot had already done a really thorough job on it anyway. If you watch his video, you see how corroded it was. And I've been scrubbing this for another 15 or 20 minutes and it doesn't look any different. So he obviously did a, a very good job on it in the first place. But although he's done a good job and I've done a, a thorough <laughs> clean on it, there's still corrosion around pretty much everything. If you look closely at every single capacitor and every single chip, you will see evidence of corrosion. So I think this is gonna be a lost cause if I'm honest with you, but I'm gonna put it in the ultrasonic cleaner just on the off chance that it might get under the chips and clean them a little bit, the places where a toothbrush and IPA can't get to. So I'm gonna use some deionized water and I'm also gonna use this PCB cleaner as well. I'm gonna pop it in there at 50 degrees for around half an hour. I'm gonna leave it in there a nice long time and we'll see if that makes any difference. Okay, so it's up to temperature now, so I'm just going to turn it on. And hopefully, it might help it out a bit. Right, okay, so it's finished. So I'm now going to clean it all with IPA and then give it a real good drying to try to evaporate off all the water. And we'll test it again, see if it's made any difference. Okay, so it's IPA time again. And then we're going to dry it all off by using a bit of heat all over it. So it is 
uh, nice and dry now, I can still feel the heat in it. So now, let's see if there's any difference on these capacitors here. Fingers crossed. Come on. No, exactly the same as before. Yeah, and there's also one up here as well. Now, interestingly enough, on a working board, I know these boards here are not working, but I also tried a working board. They do short, but they take a lot longer to short. So if you watch this now, I'm on here, watch this. So this is the side that shorts. Now watch, nothing, 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 nothing. But eventually, there you go. Now it's shorting. There, you see it's not instant. There, so I'm touching now, and then it goes off. I'm touching now and then it goes off, while with here, it's instant. And to begin with, you've seen that it took quite a few seconds before it kicked in, because I presume the meter's putting a charge into something nearby, which is then causing the short there. But if you look here, it's instant. So watch, tap, now, now, now. And when I actually get an ohms reading off it, they do read different. So let me show you on the two boards where that main chip is not faulty. So let's just go to normal ohms. And if we go here, and if we just choose the top capacitor here, you will see that it will read 44 ohms. And this one here, it's reading the same capacitor, 48 ohms. But now on Elliott's faulty board, it's reading I think it's six or something. Yeah, there you go, six ohms. So it's uh, it's a lot different, and that's the same on all of them as well. So, for example, if I was to choose the uh, the third capacitor here, on this one it's reading 43. On this one it's reading. Forty-six, and here. So it's uh, about six again, I think. There you go, six, yeah. So it's definitely not right. Uh, and also the capacitor up here as well, instantly it shorts on this one here, while on these ones it doesn't. So again, if I tap it here on both sides, short, short, you see, straight away. While with these ones, nothing, then it shorts. Straight away, nothing, then it shorts. Nothing then it shorts. You get the idea. So there's definitely differences between them. I'm almost certain that it's this main chip that's faulty. But what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna connect up the battery and stuff, and I'm gonna connect up this power connector here, because uh, Elliot did say that the backlight comes on, and I have been messing around off camera. The backlight comes on sometimes on a working display, on a, on a working one. So basically, with Elliot's screen, it doesn't work because, if you have a look closely, this little connector down here is the backlight connector. So this is the actual thing that gives it the image, but this one here is the backlight. And obviously without the backlight, we can't see the actual, we can't see what's going on. And the backlight is badly corroded on the ribbon cable. I've tried cleaning it with the fiberglass brush, but what's happened is the second pin from the inside has completely gone. So let me zoom right in to show you. Right, so if you have a look there, can you see that that pin there has disappeared completely? We've just got an outline of it. So you can see it's partly missing on the first one, the second one's completely gone apart from the end bit. So that's the reason why the backlight's not working on his display. Yet when I put the uh, his motherboard into a working display, then the backlight does work, but not consistently. Works sometimes, not every time. And it doesn't seem to, like, as soon as you plug the connector in, even though it's only reading 0.4 amps, the backlight comes on. So it's, it's definitely not working as it, as it should do. Uh, and obviously it's not displaying anyway. I was thinking, is it going to display something that's bricked, you know, like a Nintendo Switch logo, but it doesn't even do that. The other thing I've tried to do is I've tried to connect it up to my computer just in case RCM was enabled on it. And when I connect it to my computer via USB, normally on the other switches, it will make that USB sound, you know, that kind of like jingle, and then it will come up with Nintendo Switch. 
Well, when I plug this one in, it does absolutely nothing. There's no jingle when I go into device manager. It's not coming up at all. So it's not being recognized whatsoever. But what I'm gonna do is I am gonna put this power connector in it because as I say, the, the LCD, the backlight does sometimes work. So I'm gonna then leave it connected for a while and I'm gonna see if anything's getting warm because what we can do is if I can feel something getting warm, then I can put IPA on it and that might help me pinpoint the problem. So we're gonna plug this in here and I'm gonna turn it on. I'm also gonna get my charger here. Plug that in, turn this on. Right, so it's saying zero now, isn't it? Let's take the battery out and try that again. There we go, 39. Now let's see what happens when I turn it on. Nothing, it still just says 39. Right, I'm gonna leave it. I think I can already feel that getting warm unless that's the leftover heat from the, uh, the hot air. I'm gonna leave it for a while and then see if it starts to warm up. Right, it's been a couple of minutes and I can definitely feel things warming up. So the main chip here is warming up. But it's only warm to the touch, it's not hot enough to make you let go. But there definitely is heat, more heat here. Yeah, actually, this chip here is warm to the touch. Definitely, definitely, it's the, hold on. See if it's the capacitors or. Yeah, that's the chip. Right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom right in and I'm gonna get some IPA and I'm gonna drop it on there and let's see what part evaporates off. It feels like it's coming from the chip, but you never know, it might be one of the capacitors around it. Right, so you ready now? Got some IPA. Put it right over here and see where it goes from. Yeah, there you go. Can you see it disappearing off the chip? Watch. Not sure how well that's coming across in my TV. It's not looking very clear at all, but with my own eyes I can see it disappearing. Actually, it's gone cool again. Maybe it's turned itself off. Let's try to turn it back on again. Yeah, there we go. Can you see now? I hope that's coming across. Yeah, you can see it. I can see it in the view, weird, I can see it in the viewfinder, but not the TV. Look at that. So it's coming from this top corner, isn't it? This corner up here. Well, I wonder whether it's the capacitors or the, uh, the chip itself. Let's try to put it all around here, the edge, and see if it disappears. No, look at that, it's, it's the chip in the corner, isn't it? Wow. Right, just to show you the contrast, if I was to go to the chip on the other side, which should be the one that actually gets hot, if you watch this now. Can you see it's just sitting there? There you go, now it's moving slowly, but it's not like the other one. You can see it edging away slowly while the other one just disappears in a couple of seconds. See, I would say that that's completely normal. Bearing in mind this switch isn't properly on, is it? I suppose obviously if you were playing the game that would disappear pretty quick. But this side here... Look at that. Okay, so let's remove this chip and let's see if the short goes. 
If anything, it's going to be good for knowledge anyway, because then maybe it's not the main chip that's faulty. Maybe this chip is faulty that's putting that bank of capacitors, uh, you know, to, to ground. Right, so I've just put flux. I'm just going to flood it with flux. Right, let's go for this. I'm going to have my temperature at uh, 480. I'm going to have the airflow of four out of, actually three out of eight, and let's put the fan on. Let's go. I didn't think it would take this long to come off. Everything else is loose. Yeah, I think it's loose now. Oh God, I've got the shakes today. Oh my God, I'm shaking everywhere. All right, let's just pop these back where they should be. Wow, the very day when I didn't want the shakes, I've got them. Right, okay, so those uh, balls probably shorted because of me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat up the soldering iron now and uh, just to try to sort of even them back out uh, so they're all single balls again and then we'll try to do a little test just to see what's, see what's happening. If you're wondering which way to put the chip back on, can you see that there's a little dot here and an arrow pointing this way? So the dot of the chip has to be in this corner up here. Just like the picture there. Right, none of them are shortened against each other anymore. So now let's see if these capacitors are still shortened. So let's zoom out. Probably hasn't made any difference at all. Right, here we go. No, straight away. No, it made no difference whatsoever. I wonder what would happen if we tried to turn it on without that. No, I can't feel any heat build up there. Right, not that it's going to make a difference, but look, I have got these chips on these boards here, so why don't I just take it off, put it on there. It's BGA, it's not going to connect properly because I haven't re it properly, but you never know. There's a very, very, very slim chance that it will connect, and uh, I might as well give it a go. Now, you might be wondering why if I think that this chip is faulty and it's not testing faulty on this board, why I don't swap them over? Well, I believe that they're married to the board, so there's going to be other components on the board that are linked to that. Possibly this chip here, for example. So I don't, as far as I know, you can't just swap them between the boards. And secondly, if you look at the size of it, there's uh, there's no way that I'm going to have to be able to, you know, that's a proper reball job because there will be hundreds of solder connections under that. There you go, you see that one came off perfectly. Right, I'm going to try to put that straight on here now. Right, that looks like it's in its place because when I wobble it, it's going back. You see? Yeah, happy with that. Right, what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to let that cool for down for a, a few minutes. I think I'm going to heat up some of the other chips on the board, especially that power chip around the other side, and give that little nudge as well. I'm not going to take them all off, but I'm going to add flux to them, and I'm just going to give them each a little nudge, because there was such bad corrosion around them all, just in case they're not seated properly. While I've got the board warm, I might as well do that. So I'll just go around a few of them. Right, again, you can see that this one, is just moving back and forth when I tap it. Yep, so I'm going to leave that one. Mm 
And I'll test with the uh, meter as I go along. Right, so they're still all shortened straight away. And again, you can see that that's now moving, so that's been reflowed as well. Now, the reason I'm doing this, it's not gonna help if the chip is fried, but let's say corrosion's got under there and just broken the solder joint. There might be like some kind of uh, crack joint in there. Then by heating it up, it would actually help that reflow. Right, okay, and that one's done, and luckily I didn't burn that connector, so that's good. Right, I'm just going to do a few more. Right, okay, that is some of them reflowed. Do you know what? I completely forgot about that speaker connector there, so I've given that a little bit of a burning, but it should be okay. Uh, something like that would be easy just to solder the wires on, there's just two contacts at the back here anyway. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let it cool and then clean it all with IPA again and then uh, connect up the USB thing and see if it's acting any different than what it did before which I highly, I think it's highly unlikely. Now I can't it's not even worth me putting flux around this chip here because the flux is not going to make its way all into the middle here. I, I'm almost certain that this thing is fried, the main CPU, that's what I think. So if I was to put flux around here, I think all that would happen is as I heat it up, I think this chip would probably just pop because by the time it melts underneath, I think that maybe there'd be too much heat on the chip. Bridges on the uh, thing here. So let's turn the soldering iron on as well. A couple of the pins have bridged on this. Right, okay, I think that bridge has gone down there. So let's clean this board up again. Okay, so you've seen that I reflowed this one, this one here, this one, this one, the video chip round here, and also this one, and I replaced this chip here. And after doing all that, my mate Vince, aka the switch killer, has made it worse. So before it was trickle charging at 0 0.39, 0 0.4 amps, and now it's doing nothing. It doesn't make a difference if I plug the battery in or not. It isn't taking a charge whatsoever does it make a difference if I turn it on so right now it is completely and utterly ruined so I'm not exactly sure what was responsible for that but uh, yeah there you go it's not doing anything I honestly do believe that it's this chip here that's faulty in which case I think that it is unrepairable unless you were to take it off reball it and then put it back on but I don't even know, I've never seen anybody do that on YouTube, I don't know if it's possible or not. Maybe down the line as more people start working on these, maybe it is something that people will start to do. But right now that is way beyond me, way, way, way beyond me. So uh, yeah, unfortunately this switch will definitely not be working. But let's not just uh, be disheartened because only £24 was spent on this. So let's see what's working, let's see if these Joy-Con rails are working, let's see if the speakers work. Right, this is interesting, when I plug this faulty battery into this Nintendo Switch here, it does actually show a charge. You know, it's got the charge light. It shows that it's flat, but it is showing a charge. And when I look at my meter now, it is showing 0.41 amps, you know, 0.39 amps. So that says to me that that battery is actually taking a charge. So it looks like possibly the battery could be okay. Let's test a few other things. Right, okay, so the fan's definitely working. You can see that the fan's spinning here. 
So that's working. Right, unfortunately, this top section's not working. You know, the game card reader, uh, because this is also the bit that's got the digitizer cable on it. In fact, it's thrown up an error there. Right, let's turn it back off. Right, so I've got my game card reader in it now. Yeah, the speakers work. Right, the digitizer is definitely not okay. You can see I've connected it through here. Sorry, that's slightly off screen. Let me just put it that way a bit. But I'm having a look at the bottom of the screen here and it says about the restart the console. Uh, hold it down for 12 seconds again. So that is definitely not working. So now, okay, let's just quickly go through what is and isn't working. Let me just turn this off, make sure I don't do damage to my switch. Right, okay, time to conclude the video. What do I think is working on this? The battery, possibly. I'm really unsure about the battery because if any it charged up to 30%, it lost its charge very quick. Also, it's showing a very low reading now, so I'm not convinced that the battery is okay. Also, looking inside other water damaged batteries, I know that there's a protection board in here and that board gets full of corrosion. So I'm very unsure that this battery is actually okay. But what is good? The fan definitely appears to be okay. The on and off switch appears to be okay. So I presume the volume will work as well. I haven't tested that. Wi-Fi lead and Bluetooth lead should be okay. Not a lot to go wrong there. Heat pipe is gonna be okay because uh, again, water's not gonna affect that. Chassis definitely looks good. And the cover itself, the casing and the back cover, that looks good as well. Speakers are definitely working, but apart from that, that really is it. This uh, card reader here is definitely not working, and numerous things on, the, well, the motherboard's not working, the switch itself is not working. But now, when it comes to the motherboard, there still might be chips on here that are working, so it doesn't mean that it's a complete write-off. Some of these chips might well be okay. They're, they're not showing any shorts or anything. I, I don't know if they are or are not working, but personally, I would use the chips off this board on another switch to see what happens with it. So I suppose the big question is, was Elliot ripped off with this? In my opinion, now I'm not saying whether the seller was honest or dishonest in the description, you know, making out that he doesn't know what happened to it. But in my opinion, Elliot wasn't ripped off. I would pay 24 pound for this switch all day long, even now, knowing that I've ruined this here, I would still pay £24 for it because it's worth it for all the spares. Now these Joy-Con rails here look to be good on this side, but yet they're not connecting when I put anything on it. But I think looking down here, they look to be a little bit corroded, a little bit blue and a little bit green. So I think if they were cleaned up, they may well start working. In which case then, if you were just to add up the chassis, the cover and these, you've got your 24 pound back already. So would I buy this? Yes, in a heartbeat. If Elliot relisted this on eBay, for £30, I think it would sell all day long for £30 purely because of the spares. So, uh, yeah, personally, I actually think it was a good buy. So I'm going to bag this all up, send it back to Elliot, and then hopefully in the future, if he gets a switch, for example, with a 40 power chip, he can swap that over, and if he gets himself a hot air station, and then you see, again, that will, those chips cost about 12 or 13 pound on eBay, so you can see he hasn't actually got to get much use out of this to make back his 24 pound. So I think he did amazingly well on this. Really disappointed that I couldn't get it working for him, so I do apologize earlier, I honestly gave it my best shot. If you haven't already subscribed, definitely check out his videos. Elliot, thanks so much for sending this over to me and the opportunity to try and fix it. Apologies, I couldn't get it working. In hindsight, it might have been best to pay the extra money and get it over to Steve from Tronics Fix. He might have had more luck with it, but uh, who knows? We will never know. We can't turn back time to change that. So uh, that's it. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye now.